Basically, two parts of the team. First, Thessalonians, third chapter, 6 to 13. Let us together listen, Paul, and hear God's word for God's people on this, the Lord's day. Paul writes, says, Timothy, <laughs> Timothy has come back from his visit with you and has told me about your faith and your love. He also said that you will always have happy memories of us, that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. My friends, even though we have a lot of trouble and suffering, your faith makes us feel better about you. Your strong faith in the Lord is like a breath of new life. How can we possibly thank God enough for all the happiness you have brought to us. Day and night, we sincerely pray that we will see you again and help you to have an even stronger faith. We pray that God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ will let, you visit, let, let us visit with you. May the Lord make your love for each other and for everyone else grow by leaps and bounds. That's how our love for you has grown. And when our Lord comes with all of his people, I pray that he will make your hearts pure and innocent in the sight of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here this morning to introduce to some and present to others the speaker for the hour. Uh, I'm just going to give you a few things. I will fit from information, but you know, and my church family knows I am not a technology person. The talk later fast. Okay. <laughs> uh, your speaker for the day is the wife of Mr. Kenneth Caldwell, the mother of two daughters, Benet and Monica Caldwell, the daughter of Diane Smith, and the doctor, Reverend Earl Williams. Some of you that have been in the Presbyterian for a while might know him. But she was raised by her grandparents, Earl and Lucille Walter, Walter and Lucille Smith. But the most important thing that you need to know about this person today, five feet three, <laughs> glory, <laughs> a warrior, anointed daughter of our Father and Savior, Jesus Christ, the sister, and the daughter of God, mighty woman of God. So some I present to others I introduce, Mrs. Charlotte Carlin. You gonna let me sing? Yes. <laughs> All right. It's gonna give me the honor of singing, and you know what? I will. Okay. okay. I say yes, Lord, yes to Your will and to faith. I say yes, Lord, yes. I will trust You and faith. With my whole heart, I will preach, and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Gracious God, El, El, Elion, most high God, I ask that we call the four winds to attention, God, that you would hear this prayer and they would bring them up safely before you. I live before you, my precious brothers and sisters of Carm Heights. I thank you, God, for the mighty work you are doing within this part of the body. 
I ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach that indeed come Holy Spirit, come heavenly dove with all of your life giving power, I do pray. Touch us, revive us, renew us for the journey ahead. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 So I will tell you, there are times I will utilize Hebrew. Since uh, uh, Virgil and I know the Presbyterian church forced us to take it, right? <laughs> so I will utilize the Hebrew language. And afterwards, I will just say in English what that name means. This morning, this text is one that wrestled with me for a long time. And the wrestling was because I was seeking God's face for the word for you, Carver Heights. Not the word for Beth Salem, but for you. And this is the highlight in the text that I received from you. Staying the course while the battle is, war is raging. Let me say this first of all. If you're sheep, I didn't come for you today. I have come to wake up the lions. We have had sheep too long that are pushovers. It's time for the lion of Judah to awaken and take its place in the battlefield. Amen. So I haven't come to talk to the sheep. I've come to wake the lions. The Greek word daily translated as ought in this text. That's the key word that God gave me, ought. And it's a, it's a word that indicates an inward uh, constraint. It means what you ought to do and what you ought not to do, what you ought to do. Carver Heights, this is breathing. I pray this is breathing in you because God is talking about the ought in you. That part of you where God is Lord of the consciousness, that ought in you, what you ought to do, not what you want to do, what you think you should do, what your mama and papa told you to do, but the ought of God on the inside of you. What should you do? How should you be in space and time? Can you change the direction of space and time? If you understand who you are as the lion who rules the jungle. Amen. You don't even have a fight. You walk around it seven times and shout, and it falls. When God gave me this specifically for you, because there's so many of you that have that art in you, and you want to do this, and you want to do that, and you're so busy staying within the boundaries, church has changed. It is not changing. Church has changed. Let that breathe in you as well. It's not that it has changed. And there will be another shift that will come. And you need to be ready. And you need to know what it is you ought to do. Amen. And ought not to do. Amen. Many oh my. Many oh my. That is to imitate. Literally to mimic. God is telling us if we look at the lights, so we don't need to mimic another church. If you start mimicking that precious one that we love, the Lord Jesus Christ, in this text, you will understand what it is to walk through entire cities and bring new life with you. Have you ever walked in somewhere and Christ is living so big in you and someone goes, well, did you come early? God, did you send them early? See, God's waiting for those people, for those kingdom people to stand up in space and time that not just that we recognize them, but that unseen rain that seems to bother you at times, it recognizes who you are. That's important in this sea that we live in of distrust and hate. And why can't I have this? And I want my church to be like that. And I don't want my church to have this. And I just want more people in the seats. How many people did Jesus drag to synagogue? Come with me this morning. Jesus went out to the people. He went out to the people. He would go to the synagogue and teach on the Sabbath. But other than that, he was rubbing elbows with the people. Not an easy thing to do. But see, what you ought to do is understand that gospel that's in you. It's got to have legs and hands. You have to take it with you. 
See, this building just represents where you guys assemble. It has never been the church. You have been the church. I'm the church. So I walk in public and I say, hey, church. I go home, church. Church is not something you go to or what it is you. If you are confessing the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you are the church wherever you go. That should awaken you to the art. Because see, sometimes we just do what we ought to do when we walk in the building. But what you ought to do starts every day, no matter where you are, at home taking care of your children, going to work, on the highways and byways, the art of God. See, the generations must face this dilemma. There's a tension that constantly happens, and it happens with the Thessalonians, which, by the way, was one of the first books written of the New Testament. So just in case you don't know, the, Old Te the New Testament is not in order. It's in canonical order. And if you want to straighten out some of the wires, go read it in chronological order, and you will know the trouble came first before the synoptic gospels. Because you'll wonder why trouble had to come first to you before you can really hear the voice of God. It's in the book. Everything is hidden in plain sight. Guess what? We've been taught not to see it. See, the dilemma is people say, well, Jesus is coming back. You know, what about the return? And people got lazy even during Paul's time. Because during that time, they thought Jesus just went to spend time with the one who was El El Elyon, the most high God, for a few years. And here we are over 2,000 years away from that. And this text is telling you, you know what? Keep the foundation of who you are. What is that foundation? What is the good news? It is simple. God created a body for one, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, who came through a virgin, lived a sinless life, went about doing good, was filled with the Holy Spirit with measure, and then shed his own blood for each and every one of us, and then took a deep dive into hell so we don't have to go. Amen. And then when he came out of hell, he had the keys to death, hell, and the grave. So sometimes when people say, oh, the devil, no, he doesn't even have the keys to his own house. <laughs> My Lord and Savior has those keys. Yes, yes. So when you think about that return, Paul says to them, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother and sister that walk in dis disorder. Can I tell you something? Those who have been faithful to come in and hear and then go home and don't think about it anymore, we've been the disorder. Say that one more time. Because you are the power of God. If you don't get out and touch people, how will they know? If you waited for every car that drives by and every person that lives around here to come to your church, you've missed the change that God has done in church and community. You've just missed it. Amen. Amen. You have to be the power of God in this neighborhood, in this community, whether they walk in your building or not. You have to be willing to trust God in them for what's best for them. Paul was looking at their traditions that were polytheistic. They were the ones who worshipped the, the Greek gods, Alexander the Greek had started that area and all those things. But you don't have those issues. You know who God is. And all God wanted me to say to Carver Heights this morning is, there's an art in you. There's been an art in your pastor of what you ought to do, in your leaders, what you ought to do. Do it. Don't be afraid. And 
I know God can call you to do some things sometimes and people think she's mad. And they've said that a thousand times at their saying. She's mad, I tell you. There's something wrong with her. But when God tells me to do something, do it. When I started a pantry, let me tell you what, we bought food with no money because it was what we ought to do. I had food everywhere, it's what we ought to do. It wasn't what we could afford to do. But see, faith is stepping out whether you see the staircase or not. And I could go on and on about the, the things that we said in session and all those things. But God has shifted the narrative on us. Not CNN, not MSNBC. God has shifted the narrative. And my prayer is that that ought of God will just well up in you, that you will know what you ought to do. And then the tough part for me, Virgil, is God makes me fight the urge to tell people you have to come in my church. God says, let them go. Jesus did not say, go to a synagogue or anything unless you have been healed or delivered from a demon. And he said, go show yourself to the priest, follow the rituals of Moses. Or he said, go and sin no more. He did not say, join my synagogue. Right. Oh, this is the hardest part. I will tell you, Pastor Virgil, and I know what it is to be in ministry, the training. That is the hardest thing God has had me do, is have 400 people come up off our parking lot and I can't tell none of them to come to church. <laughs> See, I have my piece of the gospel. It's not my gospel, it's God's good news. And I have, I don't have the right to capture it and put it in a box, but better yet to tell people, be the church where you are. Do for people that can't do anything for you. Be the church where you are, and that will make you do the ought, what you ought to do. It'll make you say what you ought to say. It'll make you touch sometimes what you don't think you should, but you ought to. God, I thank you that in this house, there are ancestors that paved the way and all of these people just did what they ought to do. All right. Yeah. So our ancestors are not dead and gone. They are buried in every gene, every cell in our very own, own DNA. Not this building, in you. Those leaders that got together to the time and all the paperwork, it's not easy starting up a church. But they did it. All right. You don't have the right to sit down on it. Because you ought to get up. You ought to canvass the neighborhood. You ought to talk to people that you don't want to talk to because you have the good news breathing in you. And you might discover that they're already filled with the Holy Spirit and sanctified by the hand of God. If you will do what you ought to do and let's talk to them and not try to catch them like the cave bird. All right. Reverend uh, Roberts installed on April 6th, I think it was uh, 58. His untimely then Walter Gray, James Brown, the daycare, May Alexander, and Mrs. Mary McGoddery. I hope I said your name right. That God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Y'all come with me. No. They are watching you. Amen. They are watching what you do with what God had you to do, your foundation. They are watching. To do is connect to that power that they started with. You have an excellent foundation. Excellent foundation. But you know what you ought to do is stand up and start showing the whole community, then walk it on over to 85. And then when you get a chance, just go up on by the high school. Walk it out. It's just a secret in this theater. As the young people say, roll out, <laughs> roll out. You have to, this is not.
not something you can keep yourself. Jesus rolled out every day and he was whooping it on his feet. We had cars with air conditioning. Your ancestors are watching. The word for you on this anniversary is ought. What you ought to do. Not have long discussions that, that never lead anywhere, you never do anything, but something that brings legs and arms to going out and loving people and being the, the presence of Christ in this realm. What you ought to do. I know that's not easy. Because I have to do it every day, what I ought to do. And sometimes my elders, everyone will come and say, yeah, but, 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 no. <laughs> and then I hear the ought. I listen to the advice of my elders. But when that ought is in me, and I know the directive as a spiritual leader is there, then I will begin to unpack it and we'll have some conversation and I'll unpack it from the Hebrew or the Greek. Because success in God has already happened. We're not looking to be successful. We've already won. We've already won everything. Barbara Heights, my prayer is that next year this time, that not only will you call the early ancestors of this church, but your children will know exactly who these people are. They are the foundation of you. They started mighty, mighty things. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. Bring now, I pray, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, in fullness, in the people, not in the building, in the people. Yes. So when you show them what they ought to do, it will be done in the name of Jesus. All God's people say, amen. 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 amen.